how do you define a successful MC? An MC, a good MC is a movie director that is creating special moments and has the ability to quickly resolve unforeseen problems. What do you think? That sounds about right. I like that. <laughs> I would say Michael, Michael Jordan. You know, Michael Jordan's um, talent was not necessarily the fact that he was the best player out there, although he was. His talent in my eyes was because he made everybody else around him better. Um, and when I say that, I mean photographers, videographers, your catering directors, your DJ, and your guests. If your guests are standoffish, it's the MC's responsibility to make them feel unified on that dance floor. If the photographer's outside smoking cigarettes, you know, it's the MC's responsibility to make sure that they're keeping on task with whatever's happening because at the end of the day, if a photographer misses a shot, a formality shot, if the food comes out late, it's nobody else's fault but the MC because we're the center, we're the central hub of the wheel, right? Now, to add on to what Joe just said, and maybe to add a fourth thing to your category, um, we if we do our job right, we're bringing a return on investment for all your other vendors in the place, yeah. right? We're making sure that you're seated when the food is supposed to be served, that you're dancing when there's no food at all on the tables, that you know the timeline flows, that the photo and video understand what's happening, where it's going to be, what the best perspective and viewpoint for their shots might be you know, to set them up for those. Cause you can have the best photographer and videographer in the world. If we don't set up the action shots, the love and energy shots for them, then they're getting the post shots and that's it. So if you are doing your job as an MC, you're keeping in mind all of the other vendors that are on the team with you and you're working together in tandem, communicating all night long. So I'll add tra air traffic control. I like it. I like it. I like hey, Lance, it. Lance, oh, what was your original question? What, would you, what, what was the actual question? So the actual question is, how do you define a successful MC? So how I think it's actually, it's a lot simpler um, w w when you just want to direct an answer directly at the, at the question, it's consistency. Um, we all are, obviously we're all on this call together because we're some of the, some of the greats in, in the industry all up and down the East Coast. But that doesn't happen overnight. It happens with consistency. We're all on this call because year over year, client over client, um, you know, hundreds, thousands of events later, we've we've tapped into something that is consistent. Um, so when you talk about measuring someone's success, that success doesn't come and go. That success is what is created day in, day out with through consistency. I mean, in a lot of careers, you're only as good as the last thing you did. In this career, you're only as good as the next thing you do. I don't care what you did yesterday. My wedding is today. My bar mitzvah is today. My corporate celebration is today. I don't care what you did yesterday. If you don't do that now, none of that matters. Yeah, I have to agree with Purnell, guys, because, uh, I mean, everything that you guys have all mentioned is 100% correct, that, that it's our responsibility to, to make sure the photographer is there, that we're setting everything up and make sure that, you know, guests are seated when they're supposed to be, so the food is not, you know, the steak's not overcooked, but... Does our, customer, does our client actually know any of this? No, it's all happening behind the scenes. Our client has no clue that any of that happens. If you're doing your so job right. exactly yeah. what, what Purnell said. It, it's the consistency that we provide that the client actually understands and sees face value that actually makes us wanted again. Love that. The master key to every door, consistency in the grind. Yes. Good point. Question number three. Question number three is this. How do you prepare for events as an MC? So I would say one is the timeline. Another one is you gotta have your bag of tricks, right? I remember Fresh mentioned this, having a bag of tricks, having like in your, cause you know, a lot of times there's unforeseen stuff that comes up. So you gotta be prepared with backup plans, you know? So that's what I would say, that bag of tricks and have a timeline. And that comes with experience. I mean, through experience, you learn what tools you need in your toolbox. Right. You have to make certain mistakes or get yourself caught in certain positions in order to learn those things in the first place. Hopefully, you know, you have a mentor or somebody that's guiding you and training you in your career that can help you see those pitfalls, or at least most of them ahead of time. But you got to make some mistakes and then thinking on the fly and solving those problems so that no one in that room knows anything went wrong. Yes. Do you ever struggle to think up the right words to say? when you are trying to hype up the crowd during, during a dance segment of a party. What advice would you give regarding how to effectively uh, MC dance segments? 
as an MC, it was hard for me to make my presence matter because the kids were so in, into, so engaged into dancing by themselves. When I get on the mic, it's kind of hard for me to find out how can I add value to the dance party. It just comes down to allowing the party to develop naturally, right? If people are enjoying themselves and having a good time on the dance floor, why are you going to interrupt that to force your way in? Let it naturally happen. If you are needed to hype the crowd and get them moving because they're not, that's when it's more important to really think through what you're going to say before it comes out. You can't take it back once it comes out of your mouth, right? And but all eyes and ears are on you with yeah. the microphone and the but, but here's the thing. If the party is jumping and the party doesn't need me, then I feel like I'm not doing anything. No, it means you're doing yes, your job. Happen. The DJ's doing his job or her job. The dancers are doing their job. It means everyone is doing their job. When it seems like it's too easy and everyone's just having a killer time and it doesn't seem like I'm doing anything, they're just doing it. That's when you know it's all clicking and you're on the right cylinders. Don't force it. You're already in the zone. But with Sweet 16, if we're going by that, age-wise, it's different. You already have to know you have to deal with a different mitzvah. There's like the older 13, younger 13, younger 13, easier to have fun with and hands up, hands down. Older 13, you know, you got to let them do it. So you're going to guide them and don't stress yourself about how to interject. Read the crowd, as Laz said, and then jump in in the moments that it fits. Don't make yourself the moment because it's not about you. It's about the kids. And if the kids have fun at the end of the day and you felt like you didn't do anything, then it's then that's you're putting your feelings ahead of the event. So it's not about how you feel, it's about how it's turning out. When it comes to preparation, I think that this is the biggest thing. And uh, as to harken back on your last point in success, I think that preparation is what separates those that are wildly successful from those that, uh, that have some success on some parties. When you look at those of us who, who really excel, Many of us come from backgrounds in which we understand, we have a full understanding of the business side of the party. The dancing and everything else, that's just a part of it. The preparation starts years in advance for many of our clients, but certainly months in advance. It, it begins with those client meetings when we sit down with that family. When you go to these meetings, are you taking a notepad with you? Are you planning to remember everything that they say? Because you're not. Because if you're popular, you had a party last weekend, you got two parties next weekend, etc. So you're not going to remember those details. So are you taking detailed notes? Are you, uh, are, are you connecting with the family and then going out on that Saturday night and striving to deliver the party that they're looking for, or are you going out there and doing the same thing that you do every Saturday and hoping that it works? And if it doesn't, the check is in the mail. As sad as that sounds, that's who, who a lot of MCs in this industry are. They're gonna go out, they're gonna play the best songs, and if people dance, great. If they don't, who cares? Because they're not prepared. They didn't put the work in because they think it's just a party and they miss the business side of things. And I think Chad makes a great point in terms of understanding that these are individual clients and individual events, and they're all different. And if your viewpoint is, oh, it's just another bar mitzvah on another Saturday night, and not this is the Greenbaum bar mitzvah, and Noah's going to really be looking forward to X, Y, and Z, and I took all the notes. Like my clients and I, we go back and forth numerous times. We have open channel communication. Anytime something pops up in your head, I've got a section in my notes that I just throw it in there. And I build crates with my DJs based on those things as they're happening. And there are crates a year out in the DJ deck. You know, like there's no limit to these things. And preparation really comes down to how much are you focused on excelling and exceeding for this client? Do you ever get nervous? And if so, what do you do to manage your anxiety? Like before a show? Yes. Okay, Moses. Yeah. Well, there's a, uh, to be specific, there's two types of nervous energy. There is like anxious nervousness where you're eager to get it started. And then there's like just nervous where you're not prepared. If it's the not prepared part, there's not much you can do. You just got to rely on what you know, move forward. If you're nervous and the energy is anxious to get this party started, then it's just a matter of finding a way to uh, what works best individually for you to slow things down for yourself just so that way you can get that breath. You can see the scope of everything that's in front of you. So you're not missing every, and missing everything. Sometimes 
people think like, okay, let me just chug this Red Bull and I got this going. I'm gonna go, 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 go. The problems with that is you're moving so fast, you will miss something. Odds are, regardless of how good you are, there's a chance you're gonna miss something or miss a moment. And we're talking about an event that our job is to create moments out of these little moments. So that's where it is. I mean, it's it's each individual's take on what it is to slow themselves down, be it breathing, taking a second outside, um, listening to music, something that works for them. But that's, at least that's my view on that, what it calls about just getting the nerves right where I need them. I like to walk the space, like from the parking lot, the, the route every single guest is about to take to walk into a ceremony or a cocktail hour or a foyer into the dinner. I walk through, I have the timeline in my hand with everybody's name that needs to be announced at some point during the night. And I literally walk through the entire event from the parking lot through the last song of the night. And that's what just like, that's my, my thing, right? Like that's your, your methodology, you know, like a batter in a batter's box. You get tap your gloves twice, tap your hat, kick your cleats, and then you're ready to swing. It's just that repetition that gets you into that mentality. I like it. I like it. Is there anything in particular that you kind of tell yourself? Yeah. yeah it's not about me. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's good. That's you go out the door. Yeah. It has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with how I facilitate what's about to happen. Yes. Not about me. And, and Kayla? Yeah, I like that too. And just... Um, everyone's here to have fun. So have fun yourself too. I mean, maybe that can remind you to calm down and enjoy. Yeah. Look, everybody's coming to have a good time, right? You're right. Like they're coming to have a good time. They're yeah. starting off happy and excited and looking forward to this. You can only ruin it from there if you're trying to push too hard. That's right. That Allow it to develop. Yeah. That was the first piece of advice Ricky ever gave me. I get nervous before every party. So for me, it still does come down number one to that preparation. Um, I'm a note taker. I bring notes. I know that uh, that Purnell does as well. A couple of the other guys, I bring paperwork to party events. And then the second thing for that um, is my relationship to my DJ, bro. Like I can't speak for any of the rest of you all, but my relationship to my DJ, when I have uh, have have begun working with DJs in the past and started started my relationships, I tell them, bro, on parties, you're my partner. You are my you are my work wife. You are my emotional uh, dog through the airport. You are all of those things. <clears throat> Amen. Because my DJ is who it is that I talk to. And just, sometimes we talk before the party. I actually don't even like to talk about the party right before the party. I talk to my DJ about everything else but the party mm. so that I can relax and get back to uh, in the right uh, in the right hit space. And that's, uh, that, that's the way that I am. And that's the way that I operate. I like it. I like Max, it. That's why I love working with you because you're a relaxed dude, brother, when you're out there and, uh, and you get to go with Jake. I don't know if he can still hear us, but he's a great DJ as well. Your <laughs> DJ is key. Thank you, brother. Thank you. But you know what, guys, I'll say there's also a fine line. And I've noticed this, and I've been at this for almost 20 years now uh, as, as a DJ and MC. And um, there's a fine line between nerves and adrenaline rush. Because we all love it. I mean, are, do we not? Like, and you have to understand the difference. Like, just because your heart's racing, and, and it, that doesn't necessarily mean nerves. That, that's adrenaline. That, that's because we're about to do what we're so passionate about. What are some habits that help you stay on the top of your game? Like maybe a morning routine or exercise habits or eating habits or even personal growth habits. What is it for you? Everybody's different. I guess what I'm trying to say is though, there are certain success habits. Like for example, I'll give you an example. And this might not work for everyone, but I know that for me, waking up early is a game changer. I can wake up early and exercise in the morning to start the day off with some exercise. It just changes the game and it helps me just to be more creative and everything. You know, like everyone in here is very high achieving. And so I'm just curious to know, have you pinpointed maybe a certain type of thing that you do that helps you not just to become a great MC, but just to become an overall healthy person, Chad? A couple of things, Lance. Um, number one, one of the one of the things that allowed for me to take my career in this industry uh, to the next level is that I had to cut some things out. I actually 
I used to, uh, I used to, all honesty, I used to hit the bar very hard on Friday nights. And, uh, and even though our events are not until, you know, seven, eight o'clock the next day, a lot of that would still be lingering within my system on the next day. So my brain would be cloudy, you know? And so again, as a master of ceremonies, you go into these events and you're not sharp. If you're not sharp, then you're not able to think of things in the, uh, in the moment as fast as, as you would otherwise. And then kind of to your point, I do believe, and it's not for everybody, but I do believe that physical fitness is important for many of us, but here's the reason. The reason is, is because in order to do this job well, confidence is key. You had better be confident in yourself because the second you go out there with a microphone in your hand, three, four, 500 people out there looking at you, if you don't have confidence, you will melt yep. or you got to pretend to be something that you're not. So for me, staying in shape and that physical fitness is important because it helps me uh, maintain who it is that I am. What are examples of non-financial emotional fulfillment you get from your career as an MC? I never lose track of the fact that we are, again, that this is not a party, but that this is a very major moment in the lives of a family. I'm a, I'm a family guy myself, and this is not to be cliche at all, but because at, at our level, parties can be tough, bro. You know what I'm saying like like as you it, at, at all parties are can be difficult, but as you climb the 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 ladder, the parties get more difficult. The clients can become more difficult because they're more demanding. And so when you can always remember that this is a moment for them, that that kid is not just a mitzvah kid. He, he he's a 13 year old with a life. That mother, that father, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you can remember that this is about truly about the family and about that moment and attempting to uh, to find those moments. It can make this this whole thing a lot better. That's good. And Pernell? Yeah, Lance, uh, the fulfillment I feel and the, the feeling that I get is I never lose sight. Uh, and I didn't recognize this when I was a young man, when I was 18 years old, just getting started. Um, you know, you do this for a few years and then you take a step back from your own career and then you recognize and realize you get the, you get the opportunity as an MC, as an entertainer to step foot in places and do things that you would not do as a normal human being. If you worked a federal job, you wouldn't step, step into certain situations. You wouldn't be in a club room of Raven Stadium. You wouldn't get an opportunity to go to a Ronald Reagan building. You wouldn't be able to step on the field at Giant Stadium as a regular human being, but we're super, we're super humans, we're superheroes. In the entertainment world, when you take a step back and realize, I'm given the opportunity week in, week, week out to do things and to, to, to go to places that people don't normally have the opportunity to do. Um, so that's something that you really can't put a price tag on. I've flown all over the nation to perform and it's, you don't get that opportunity at, at, at most other careers. There are some, but not most any, any of it. That's good. Last. I just want to add to what just Purnell just said, because I just had this feeling on Saturday when I worked, I worked with a full band dancers, the whole, the whole nine yards. I don't know if you guys saw a couple of videos that I posted, but it, it was, and, and during that time, I, I, I actually stood on stage. In fact, I posted a little video today and I said POV, right? Because my point of view, best seat in the house. And I truly meant that because while there were and they were singing a lot of stuff live and i mean i don't know how many of you guys get to work with bands and stuff but um it's it's it, like literally i stood there and i had goosebumps at one point just going down my body and i said like how lucky am i that i get to do this and that i get to be in the presence of you know these other professionals that like you know it, it's indescribable almost because it's such a good feeling and that, that's the feeling it's you can't money is you can't buy that that's powerful powerful last i mean other than the the incredible once in a lifetime experiences that that some of us or most of us have been fortunate to be able to have um we are trusted with the most important day in somebody's life consistently and we only get one shot we might do 50 events a year 100 events a year 500 events a year whatever your routine is or how often you get out the fact of the matter is you might do 500 events this year. They only get one shot at this. That's right. You That's only right. get one shot at this. That's right. That's right. And so it, that to me is the fulfillment is recognizing that and then delivering upon it. 
so that it's a unique experience customized to this particular client and these particular guests. That's correct. And That's it's correct. resonating. Hey, Ryan Wazer told me something that really changed my mindset regarding um, parties. Uh, Brian, you might remember this. He said, Brian once said, there's three types of people at every party. He said, there are people that will dance no matter what. There are people that will sit no matter what. And then there's a third type. The, the third type is people that are in between. And they will dance if, if you create the right environment for them to dance. They will dance. And I thought that was so brilliant. And I always kept that in mind that when we're at these parties, there's some people that we won't reach no matter how dynamic we are. We don't have to worry about those people, but let's get the people that are in between. And I think most people are kind of either dancing no matter what, or they're in between, you know? So I think it, those numbers, particularly 20% dance all the time, 20% don't dance at all. And then the 60% in the middle is yeah. who you have to play with. And if you can even delve into that 20% who never usually dance and get a few of them, that's when you're really cooking. Yeah. I see your hand, Moses. <laughs> Moses, yes. Um, for me, while I enjoy doing this is, it's, I think everyone said some version of it, but it's just, it's feeling, it's having fun. Part of it is, yeah, as a performer, I love the stage. Uh, my goal is always to have the ability to earn the larger stage. So upping the ante, getting more responsibility. But with that comes the ability to share a level of joy. And this job, I mean, like, is, is actually right there with any type of entertainment performer. So if you're on stage of any variety, your job is to bring some sort of emotional response from your audience. And ours is specifically for joy. And there's few jobs where your goal is to make sure you bring as much joy to everyone in the room, not just one, but as much people as possible. And so for that reason, beyond money and beyond everything else, I think for me, that's that's what it is because it's not just me facilitating it only it's me being part of it mm -hmm. so sharing the emotions with their parents grandparents the stories the friends and then even in, as a bonus making friends through that um that's what makes this job unique uh when i do theater work there's a separation stage up here audiences down here with film cameras here you never see the response but with this with live engaging entertainment that is on the same level. Everyone is really on the same level. Yeah, we have lifts, but being very general, being specific, I should say, is we're on the same level. And so we're sharing that motion, that moment with them. So that's why we have to be engaged with it. As everyone would say, be on that level. It's because we are there literally physically on that level. So that brings a level of joy for me and helps me to deal with all of the micromanagement, all of the added headaches that this job has because that you can't buy, you can't rent, you can't find it in many, many occupations that can honestly pay as much as a side gig all in the course of one day within four to five hours. Powerful, powerful. Next question, next question is this. And this is a very sensitive question, right? Um, but very powerful. It's what tips do you have regarding how to effectively manage your finances in a career in which your income often fluctuates significantly from week to week. Spend that shit and hope for the best. <laughs> and, look, and look, I'll jump in and say, and say one thing real quick. Tracking your finances, just tracking it on a, at least a weekly basis, just being aware of your finances helps because I think a lot of it, it could be a spending issue, you know? But what do you guys think? Figure out, figure out what's a need and what's a want. If there's something you need, get it because you put it off, you're still going to need it. If it's something you want, that means that there's no rush to have to have it. You can put it off to the side. So if you're talking about finances within a business of buying new shirts, new suits, new shoes, gas, car maintenance, you got to figure out, again, what is a necessity and what is a luxury? I mean, that's simply that's been working for me. So, Kayla? Yes, Kayla. Okay. Uh, make a budget, know how much play money you have. The rest is like you can't that's what you have uh for your for your bills and stuff the rest is play money and make some investments too um don't just end it you know your play money on everything but try to invest too that's good and i think i think one thing that COVID taught us all is the importance of having an emergency fund right so before you take that next vacation 
make sure you save up at least three to six months of your living expenses, right? <laughs> it's, it's weekend work, weekend work only. You shouldn't, there's a lot of entertainers that get involved uh, in this industry thinking that this is their full-time work uh, if they don't own the business. Uh, that, is, that is a falsehood. If you're emceeing on the weekends and that's all you do on the weekends, that money is, should be money you put on the side, remembering that a third belongs to the government. Um, the other two thirds should not be used or it should not be used in a capacity that you would a nine to five Monday through Friday. So it's money on the side for you and your family to enjoy, plan vacations around, reinvest into something uh, uh, um, uh, attached to your career Monday through Friday, but it should not be your sole source of income. And that's where a lot of entertainers make the mistake is they rely solely on weekend work in order to take care of Monday through Friday uh, priorities and responsibilities. Yeah, I mean, to Purnell's point, you know, yeah, the best plan of action is to have another job while you're doing the weekend warrior piece. Um, but there is a potential for weekend warrior to be full time income level. You can make a full of a full time job level income if you do this the right way and if you get enough bookings. And if you do that, you got to understand that everything in life is either an asset or a liability. This either brings value and return for what I'm spending or it's going to just cost and be an expenditure and I'm not getting any return on that at all. And the biggest thing that really sort of changed my focus was understanding that principle alone. Assets versus liabilities. And I think it was Moses who said needs versus wants. Mm -hmm. how, how do you maintain a strong work ethic? For example, you know, I think that one of the principles is that, you know, success does not lead to happiness. Happiness leads to success. And so if you're do if you're really enjoying what you're doing, it's, it's, it's easier to maintain that work ethic because you have a passion for it, you know? But hey, guys, you know what? I was thinking about something, though, too. When we talk about the quality of an MC, you got to think about this. There's different types of parties, right? So for an MC might be great for a certain type of party. They might be the goat on certain types of parties, but they might not be the goat on other types of parties. So that's something to think about, too. Sometimes we're not comparing apples to apples. I don't know about that, Lance. I hate to, 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 to go against you here, but a goat is a goat anywhere. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. Absolutely. It's, it's and I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, this is actually to the tools. The comment ties to the tools because you can't use every tool for every event. And as an MC, we have different ways we say things, different ways we approach things, different sets of the songs we would like to have in order. So if you were to use one formula specifically for every event, then of course you'll just be passable. But if you learn to read the room, which is the, I think the one of the biggest keys, if not the first one, the relationship to everyone in the room with your clients previous to the room and then in the room, that'll help you be able to figure everything out. Because then if you're the greatest, which look to me, my money, fresh jumps into any room, any situation. He will find the song eventually. He doesn't stop trying. And eventually he can also use the bags of tricks he's learned from previous amount of times where he's been stuck or had to get himself unstuck because of a crazy situation that was outside of his control. That to me is greatness because it works every time. You can't solidify it into one nice box, but you can pull from that box and it'll always work depending on what it is you're pulling from. Good point. And Laz, I see your hand. Yeah, man. Um, look, I developed a process like 10 years ago called the psychology of the guest. And it delves into no matter what the crowd is, no matter what kind of event, no matter who's in the room and what our purpose in it is. This is a way that you can approach the event and psychologically through empathy, just understand how the guy in the back of the room is going to take away some, some type of emotion that we're creating. Why is this bridesmaid going to remember this wedding over the 10 other weddings she's going to this year, right? And if you can delve into understanding how people expect certain things, how the emotional roller coaster is going to be traveling all night long and be in control of it, mm -hmm. then you can take things to the next level and you can get yourself to that goat status. Um, and yes, Chad, you are absolutely in the conversation, my brother, as is fresh for sure. Um, and Chad, Chad is from the fresh school of MC. One so it's, it's, it's not, it's not a surprise that he turned out as fantastic as Thank it is. You. One, one million percent credit to fresh. Yeah. And Joe, I see your hand. Yeah. Just to jump off of Laz's point, I, I, I love that. And I talk to my clients a lot about like the psychology of how people think and making people feel a certain way. It honestly, I mean, not to, you know, to um, minimize what DJs do because they're, you know, 
they're certainly the main reason why a dance floor gets packed. However, it's less about the song and it's more about how you, how you, I guess, use your words to make people feel a certain way. So like an MC that's like, all right, dance floor is open. Let's be party. You know what I mean? Versus like somebody that's like, all right, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, you nearly would have chosen a very special song and wouldn't it be great to, you know, incorporate everybody to join them, all the friends and couples, all the couples in love, you know what I mean? And like, and, and kind of almost use a little bit of Jewish guilt to, to bring them onto the dance floor Right. Because, I mean, to be honest, at the end of the day, any schmuck in a cummerbund can play Bruno Mars top 40 song. You know what I mean? Right. All right. And Chad, I see your hand. Uh, to your point, Lance, although, uh, like these gentlemen said, you know, you do have to if, if you're going to be one of the best, you do have to be able to be versatile in what it is that you're doing. But it's also important to admit that there are other people who do things that that you just don't do. And I think that that's one of the things that, that's difficult when you first become an MC is that you want to be able to do everything as great as everyone. And that's just not who you are. I'll never be able to dance like Moses, ever. Never will I be able to dance like Moses. I'll never be able to choreograph like that. Pernell, sometimes when I work on Pernell's parties, I'm, I'm in awe of the way that he uh, that he controls the crowd, the way that he plays games. Pernell plays games with kids. You would think that it was a Hollywood production, but, it, but it's excellent. It's excellent because it puts everybody in the right mindset and it makes them feel good. And there are other, uh, there are other MCs out there and people that I've worked with that I feel that, that I feel the same way about. So it's important to know that you don't have to be a five star, that's an athletic term. You don't have to be a five star in every category. You gotta be the best at who you are and to take pieces of what everybody else does. Ricky, I, I knew I went. Ricky is the greatest cocktail hour performer in the history of this industry. There is no one that's better during cocktail hour than Ricky Ricardo right there. And there's so much know, to Jay, learn from that, nobody. Take these pieces from other people and add them to your game while being comfortable with who it is that you are. Always be learning. Always be learning something that you want to incorporate, change and adapt to your style or that you never want to do. Every time I'm at an event, I'm looking around the room and I'm noticing what I want to do, what I would like to incorporate, what I want to reimagine and what I never, ever want to do. Mm. Good point. Good point. Which as, as an MC, what are... What is your view of work-life balance? How do you manage work-life balance? With being an MC? Yeah, I mean, like, as you know, like, 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 for example, for example, right? Our work as an MC usually is like nights and weekends, right? Especially the weekends. And then a lot of times that's family time, especially if you have kids and everything. So has that been a struggle for you guys, especially those of you that have kids? I can, I right? can start. Um, my wife and I talk about this all the time and I always thank her for the fact that one, she holds down the fort on the weekends um, and allows me to pursue my passion and pr pursue what I love to do. Um, so I think that is extremely important is having the right partner in, in the mix. And uh, because I personally know a couple DJs in my sphere who's um, were a little bit younger, but they're just having kids and their wives told them you're done and they are done. Um, and, um, you know, things like that, when you hear things like that, it makes you so appreciative of, you know, your relationship. And, and I hope you guys are, it sounds like, you know, Joe just mentioned, I know Purnell, uh, Chad, you know, family men who, uh, are allowed to do this and, and continue doing this. And it is, it's a tough balance, right? Because yes, we're not there. I've missed, you know, all of us, how many birthdays have we missed? How many weddings and funeral i mean literally we have missed these life events because we were at somebody else life somebody else's life event yeah that that, that was very uh, oh sorry lance yeah. um for me that was uh that was really difficult probably the first uh five or six years um i i actually lost a couple of friends a couple of close friends who you know i couldn't be at their weddings and they just didn't understand um and also for the family as well but fortunately after you've done it for a while your family begins to understand and it is important you got to have the right woman bro or, or or in kayla's the right man or if any of us you know you got to have the right partner you gotta have the right partner because if your partner doesn't understand if you are 
if on a Saturday night, there are so many things that are going on on a Saturday night. And as an MC, there's so many things that we have to concern ourselves with. If you also have to concern yourself with receiving a text from your partner who's angry because you're away from home, it's not going to work, bro. Nah, it's nah, just nah. something's not going to work. Either nah. your party's not going to work or your relationship isn't going to work. And it, uh, and it depends on who you are. Nah. Pernell, I see your hand. Uh, yeah. Um, and Chad and Max, I mean, they hit the, the nail right on the head. And it's just funny to hear Chad try to stumble through all the political correctness of having a partner. <laughs> first of all, first that's of all. his coach speak. That's his coach speak. <laughs> we have to get better. <laughs> uh, secondly, um, I agree 100% with what they're saying, but I'm also a huge proponent of boundaries. Um, and my clients, what's understood is I don't have meetings outside of Monday night. If my client can't do a Monday night meeting, they are going to have to work with my schedule, not the other way around. Um, also my agency, um, they know also if I'm not working on Sunday, I'm not work. Don't contact me. Don't, I'm not, I don't contact me about work. Don't contact me about a gig. Um, because I do work, you know, I do 45, 50 events I'm seeing a year and then I'm performing 10, 15 times as a DJ or dancer, um, when, what little time I do have is sacred to me and my family. And uh, I don't like anyone treading on that. So um, I, I'm very specific with my boundaries. Uh, that way I know Monday night, hey, my wife knows. Monday night, I'm not gonna be here or I'm gonna be on the phone for an hour or two or what have you, but you have my full attention, sweetheart, Tuesday through Friday, and then all day on Sunday. Um, so boundaries are huge. And unfortunately, when you're just starting or you're just beginning, you won't have that luxury. But after you do a thousand event, 1500 events, 2000 events, you can finally have that luxury of saying, okay, I've established my career. I've established my, my presence. Here are my boundaries and abide by it. Or I'm sorry, you're going to have to abide by it. There is no alternative. I'm horrible at boundaries. Because look like like um and this I think this is for so many of us. Um we do we get the opportunity to do things that we love. You you feel me? So like none of it uh Joe, you don't but I also work in sports as well. Nothing that I do, that's my Pernell. I for those of you who don't know, I've been working in sports, but <laughs> nothing that I do is work, right? So for me, I struggle with this because anytime a call comes in, anytime an email comes in, anytime a text comes in, I run to it. And now I have a son who's uh, who's 15 months old and none of you guys have met him uh, and that hurts my feelings. But uh, now that I have a son, I know that I had to create these boundaries and it's uh, and that's going to be a challenge for me. It really is. Shout yeah. out to Kobe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Joe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, just like Chad, I mean, I, I, for a while, I was a slave to the job, uh, if I'm being honest. Like, I had a, a wife who worked with me full time, and now she's gone, and, and, you know, I'm very proud of her. She's doing her own work right now, um, and I'm, I'm kind of, like, handling everything at the moment because I want her to be happy. But at the same time, like, every time the phone rings, it's a prospective client. If I don't know the number, if it's not a friend, it's a prospective client, and my mind goes, all right, well, they're probably sitting in front of a bunch of other DJ companies, just calling, calling, calling. And the first person that picks up, if they've got the schmooze and the charisma, you know what I mean? They're going to do it. They're going to nail it. And that there goes, you know, X amount of dollars out the window, Joe. So like, if I'm on a, if I'm on a date with my wife, like my first instinct when that phone call is to pick it up and just excuse myself, even though I know that that's not great to do. But, you know, I think that, you know, in, in a different financial position outside of COVID, I would hope that, you know, I would be able to take the Purnell approach for sure. When you think about your success and think about your life, who, who would be some of the key mentors that stand out? And what's something that they told you that has stayed with you? Like something that they instilled within you that has stayed with you? Um, well, I didn't even really see myself doing this. I don't know how some other people got into it, but I was kind of, you know, Ricky saw it in me, really. And he was like, you should do this. And I'm like, okay. And Wait, you know, I was Ricky. like, wow, this is amazing. I love this. And he kind of like, you know, foresaw it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he's been an amazing mentor. And uh, he always said, don't blend in. And that has helped me a lot. That's real. 
I, I mean, I, I started um, my company when I was 15. Um, but I, I had the honor and privilege of going to a load of bar and bat mitzvahs. And I saw a lot of other performers. And I, while I was enjoying myself, I was, I was, you know, a little bit quieter than I am today. And I was just kind of absorbing everything. And I guess through osmosis, I have like the Jewish shtick that I've learned, not necessarily through a, a, a mentor, one or the other, but through just getting those experiences uh, under my belt uh, and then like just falling on my face, you know, a lot. Um, but um, I also go to a lot of DJ seminars too. And while I, there wasn't anybody like holding my hand or teaching me how to cue or how to hold a microphone or anything like that, um, you know, I, I look up to guys like Mike Walter um, in New Jersey, um, like Joe Bunn down in the Carolina area. Um, and these guys are just, you know, very talented in what they do. And I'll just sit there and I'll listen and I'll ask appropriate questions. But like, I mean, I, you know, that, that and YouTube, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, you know, just, just real briefly, man, I, Ricky, I, I don't know if I ever told you, but again, when I first got into the industry, I met you, you're one of the first people that I met, and I really, really took so much from you when I, when I first got into the industry, so I thank you for that. Uh, Moses, you and I, we have been, well, it's it's been all up for the last five years, but for a while, there was up and down, but, <laughs> but there was always, but there was always so much respect and so much love there, and I've learned so much from you. Uh, through the process. Pernell, uh, I am an, again, athletic background. I am a competitor. And even when I love you, I want to beat you at every, at every turn. But I think that, that our relationship has grown to a point now where even though we want to beat each other, we have so much love and respect for one another that we know that uh, that it's all love at the end of the day. But just to answer this, and I don't mind if this is the last thing that we talk about, uh, my, my mentor, my brother, my uncle, sometimes my father figure, all of the above, it has been fresh. Um, I met fresh when I was, I think like 25 years old, but I had, I was so all over the place and even though I was blessed to grow up with the father, I never necessarily had a father figure who played an everyday role in my life. And Fresh was that. The Scots provided, I'm from the 757 area, the Scots provided a family for me here in the Maryland area when I didn't have a family here in Maryland. They introduced me to all of you wonderful people in, in, in one way or the other. And Fresh and I, you know, we talk now about life, bro. We don't even talk about work, but we talk about life. He's one of my closest friends and he has helped me in every aspect of life. Uh, another individual is definitely Robert Sherman, uh, who is the owner of Washington Talent. Uh, I feel like Robert, especially over the past 10 plus years for me, uh, and a lot of you on this on this call don't have a uh, personal relationship with him, but um, this man breathes success. If you want to talk about the, the archetype to, to, of this industry and someone who, who has got this down to a science, it's him. So that's the second part of my foundation. The third and probably the most important part of my foundation is really the people I surrounded myself with over the past 16, 17 years who are more successful than myself at any given point. That is your Chaz. That is your Moses. That's Andrew Laris. That's Maxim, I mean, Kayla, Ricky, there's all these, every single person I've ever come across to, and, I, and I, I've literally sat back and I'm like, holy, wow, like, I never thought to do it that way. I, that, that's my admiration. I might be at the top of the game, or it could be sw swapping places with Chad, or what, most, or what have you. I might be at the top of the game, but I'm humble enough to realize that the reason why I'm here is because of the foundational pieces of that third piece that I have, that I'm always learning something new from people who are better than me. Um, so, and that even started when I was 18 years old, I saw Moses perform for the first time when I was 18. This is I almost 20 years ago now. I don't remember that. I remember the pizza place we went to afterwards, but I don't remember yeah. that, man. Yeah. So I, I set up his entire event. I set up his lights. I set up his everything. And he's yelling at our boss on the phone at the time. And I'm just like, wow. I mean, this guy's got balls. He's talking to his boss like that. But it speaks to his character, the fact that he stands for what he stands for. So there's always something I take away. And that's why I say my, my mentors are threefold. That'd be Fresh, Robert Sherman, and the better individuals I surround myself with. A uh, guy that I started working with out of New York at about, he was, I was probably 15 years old. And he just took me under his wing um, and, and uh, pretty much um, 
you know, like was said earlier, you just absorb, right? You're just there. Uh, and at that time, I, I didn't even have, you know, I was too young to even understand that this is what I wanted to do. I knew I had a passion for music. I knew I had a passion for entertainment because I grew up in it. My dad and, and my mom were were entertainers back in the Soviet Union. Um, and and, and I, so deep inside, subconsciously, I knew I wanted to do this, but it wasn't one of those things to where, hey, I'm going to watch what he does and do it too. No, it was just like, absorb, take in, take in, take in. And eventually you took in enough to, you know, there, there came a time where, where, you know, just, the bird kind of, you know, flew on its own, so to speak. And, um, but I, I, if it wasn't for that experience, it would have never happened. You know, success leaves clues, right? Success leaves footprints. And so I, I thank you guys for taking the time to come on because it's so true that, you know, success does leave footprints. And I think that over the last two hours, there's been certain things that have been said that were just very precious, you know? But my last question is this, is I want to ask, um, how do you feel about this program that we did? This has been really cool to be a part of um, and to be here with people that I've had respect for for so many years. Um, is just awesome. And I think that there's a lot of value here. Tonight's event was truly special. I mean, to have the opportunity to sit and learn from some of the other excellence and greats that, uh, that, that do this in the game, to be able to pick up from their best practices and, uh, and even to learn from things that they did that they wished that, that maybe they wouldn't have. I just truly want to thank you for bringing us all together and hosting this event, Lance. It has, uh, it has improved me as a master of ceremonies being here with you. I appreciate that, appreciate that. And guys, let, let's definitely keep in touch and hopefully we can come together, maybe, um, you know, semi-annually or something, you know, where we just come together like this.